Hello, hello, and welcome back to Expecto Podcastium. Uh, last time we ended with chapter eight. We were talking about Snape and then um, Harry and Ron's visit to Hagrid and the mystery, the mystery of the Gringotts break-in. And now we're going to be talking about chapter nine and ten. Once again, I'm Mega, one of your hosts. I'm Erica, your other host. And I'm Jess, your third host. Great. So let's get talking. So chapter nine is the Midnight Duel. And it basically goes into uh, Harry and Draco's great duel that never really happened. <laughs> and everything that comes after that. Yeah. So what do you guys think of this chapter? This chapter is a lot of fun because, like, well, not fun, but more just, it really sets the tone for how much of a little shit Draco is. <laughs> like, we're already getting that sense, but this one just, just tells you, okay, this character is going to be, a, like, so frustrating for Harry. <laughs> you guys know what I mean? Yeah, completely. I love how the first sentence in the chapter is that Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley. But that was before he <laughs> met Draco Malfoy. It's like, that's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. Yep. I love it. It, it was like, I, I remember that always makes me laugh whenever I read that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Draco is a total little shit in this one. Well, I mean, he's a, he's a shit in, in most of the books, but this one is just just one of those kids where, you know, if, if you were going to school with him, you just kind of want to slap him, you know? <laughs> I also found it, like, one of the things that I like about this chapter is Harry flying for the first time and just how he feels when he's flying and how it just happens naturally. I, I really agree. I really love the fact that, like, something like flying just comes so naturally to him and how much he loves it and... It's really nice to see how realistic it was, how, like, nervous he was. I mean, if someone suddenly told you that, like, oh, my God, if you, like, get on this broom, you're going to start flying. Like, that that's very weird. And, like, I, I just love how, like, it sounds so odd, but then he's such a natural. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I really love how um, when their first learning and um, Madame Hooch tells him like the first step is to say up and Harry is one of the only people, one of the few people who's able to get his broom on the first try. And it's kind of like this first time where Harry, who didn't come from a wizarding background and stuff, kind of is like almost ahead of his peers and he feels like he like fits in and he's doing things right. Like he's, he's able to get a broom when so many other people aren't. Totally. And Pravati telling Malfoy to shut up is just like, yeah. <laughs> that was totally awesome. I loved that completely. Also, McGonagall being so excited about Quidditch is such a like awesome thing because you know she's she's a strict person. I always think her as being very serious, but whenever I read her lines during this, I always think of her smiling and being so excited, you know? Yeah. Um, I really love McGonagall in this, like, this part, especially, like, when she catches Harry, she's, like, just, like, not sass, I can't think of the right word, but she just has, like, this, like, secret, like, excitement, and, like, Harry thinks that he's about to get in the biggest load of shit, but, like, she just goes to um, Oliver, and she's, like, I found you a seeker, and she's just, like, super excited about it, and Harry's just, like, Oh, cool. But it's like, like, thought he was going to get into so much trouble and, like, found out he's actually, like, getting rewarded, you know, for lack of a better word. Yeah, definitely. And you can, like, almost imagine how completely confused Harry must have been. Like, he thought it was going to be um, expelled. And then McGonagall and Woods have this conversation back and forth about quidditch and like seekers and the woods like studying him and harry's just like what the nonsense is going on <laughs> i also like how him being good at this kind of gives harry this confidence boost it, it just kind of makes him feel good and make him makes him realize that 
he's good at something to do with magic and you know he's just gonna get better so uh, that's one thing that i like a lot about him being so good at it so then we have malfoy um telling them to do a duel yeah. i always think like what's their thought process with this it's just like literally they've learned like no spells <laughs> harry doesn't even know how to do a duel <laughs> it's just like <laughs> yeah no it is it's like very i kind of like you know just like imagine like these cute little like prepubescent like little boys and their little high pitched voice are saying like we're up for the duel and they're like yeah i'll meet you at midnight in this place and it just kind of makes me laugh more than anything else oh yeah i really loved this scene because it really showed the how awesome ron is the way he like where malfoy immediately was like oh, i'll take you on any time wizard's duel you want to do this? And then Boss was like, oh, you've never heard of this, right? I'm going to humiliate you. And Ron immediately is like, nope, nope, Harry knows who he's talking about. I'm a second. Who's yours? And then, like, Ron immediately is there to support Harry and is immediately, like, telling him everything and making him feel better and just like, oh, punch Malfoy if you don't know anything, you know? <laughs> I want to I wanna quote here, literally, this, this was the first line I read that made me really realize that Ron is going to be my favorite character even before I like finish the series and it was and what if I wave my wand and nothing happens throw it away and punch him on the nose Ron suggested <laughs> I love that he's just like if it doesn't work just punch him <laughs> yeah I really like that scene as well. It just yeah, like um Mega said earlier, it just shows he's like first of all he's super funny, but also like he's just like so supportive and he's just like also always gonna be there for him. For Harry. Totally. This is like so early in their relationship. He was like chatting out in the first book and they only met like a few chapters ago and Ron's already run just do anything, you know? Yeah. He's such a good friend. Oh, Ron's just, he just makes me smile. Except yeah. for some of his moments, like Goblet of Fire, sometimes I really wanted to punch him. <laughs> but, you know, I think everyone wanted to punch Ron at some point in Goblet of Fire. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody wanted to punch every character at some point <laughs> in the series. That's definitely yeah. true. So I think my next favorite part is um, right after Ron says like that thing about punching Draco, then we get Hermione who comes in and like butts herself into their conversation and she's like, excuse me. And like Harry and Ron are like, like they just look up and they see her. You can just like tell they're annoyed. And Ron is just like, can't a person eat in silence in this place? And like they just get so irritated with each other, but that like, like if you put yourself in their situation, you'd also get like super irritated. Like this random annoying girl suddenly like inserted herself into your private conversation. It's like just go away. There's so many Hermione moments where she reminds me a lot of myself of just kind of not reading social situations and just saying something random and realizing that maybe I shouldn't have said that, you know? Yeah, like, completely. I think it's also really interesting because I, when I was rereading this, my first impression, of course, when I first read this book all those years ago, was that, oh my gosh, Hermione, <laughs> like putting her nose into everything, gosh. But then rereading it, I'm kind of curious, and I wonder if you guys see this as well. I'm kind of curious if Hermione like the way she was talking about how, oh, think of all the points you'll lose Gryffindor. It's a very selfish of you. I'm kind of wondering if she was actually really worried and she was just using that to cover it up or if her, shoes, or if her main concern was actually the points. Hmm. I've never really thought about that. If she was concerned, I think she would have been like forward enough to say, no, it's not safe. But maybe I need to give it a little bit more thought because, yeah. I've always kind of felt that in the earlier books, Hermione was a very frustrating character, but I, I always think that 
in those moments where she was being very frustrating and annoying, I think she probably went, like, after that happened, she probably went back and, like, learned from, sometimes learned from what happened, you know? Like, that's what happened with me. I would make a mistake and I'd be like, oh, I should not have done that at all. That was so bad. And then I kind of, I learned from that. And it takes time. And we see that throughout the books with Hermione. Yeah, I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying. And it's probably also because um, she didn't have any friends before. So she probably wasn't very good with, like you were saying, like with social cues and everything like that. And she didn't really know how to, for lack of a better word, again, to like communicate. Yeah. I also just want to say that I love that Neville's grandmother is referred to as Gran because I called my grandmother Gran and no one in North America does that. It's only in the UK. So like my grandparents are from England. So that's why I called my Gran Gran because my dad called his grandmother Gran. So it just happened. And like no one else uses that word in North America, almost no one. So whenever I see that, I just like makes, gives me a little smile. <laughs> That's very cute. Well, um, next, the Harry and Ron decide to go out at midnight for the duel, and they find Hermione in the common room. And I really love how J.K. Rowling explains her as hissing like a goose, because it makes me giggle <laughs> every time I read it. A pink bathrobe and her hissing like a goose and following them. And then, unfortunately, the fat lady is out for a stroll or something, and so Hermione stuck with Harry and Ron. And they come across Neville, and this quartet wanders off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's so funny. Just like Harry and Ron are so, like, they just don't want Hermione there, but like she's stuck with them. And they're like super reluctant about it, but then they end up coming across Peeves. <laughs> And that is so exciting. Because, like, Peeves, you just see he's already up to his, like, normal shit. And I'll let the two of you go on from there because it's too exciting not to ask your guys' opinion. Peeves is one of those characters where, knowing me, I would get so frustrated with Peeves because I'm not good at people, like, bugging people as a joke. I've just never been good at like accepting that as a joke, if that makes sense. Like I'm really bad at understanding sarcasm and that always caused me to get more frustrated. So Peeves is just one of those characters where you just, you see him mentioned and you just kind of roll your eyes. But you know, I, I like that he come order the Phoenix. He has a tiny character arc. I like that part. Even though he's like a very minor character, I like how J.K. Rowling gave him that little tiny character arc. Yeah, I think part of the reason that I like the I admire the Weasley twins is because I wish I could be the kind of person who would not get frustrated by Peeves and kind of have like that sort of tentative alliance sort of thing with him, you know. But I agree with Erica. I feel like knowing myself, I would get very frustrated at Peeves and like want to retort, but like always hold myself back and just get very frustrated. <laughs> He's a fun character to read about, you know? Yeah, he's definitely very fun, but again, I'm in the same boat. Like it's funnier watch it's funnier watching him tease other people, but if it was turned on me it would be a whole other story. And I really love how Peeves like he's he you can see in this um chapter that he causes chaos for the four of them. But he also yeah. isn't on the side of the teachers either. Like he doesn't tell Filch where they went either. He no, like he's just he just likes to cause shit. Because exactly. like because he shouts like students out of bed, students out of bed. And then when Filch actually comes, he's like, I'm not telling you where they are. Exactly. <laughs> Peeves just kind of he just kind of bugs everyone. But one thing I've always wondered is, like, where did Peeves even come from? Like, who was Peeves? Why is he there? 
Why is he still there? Like, who, what, what, it, like, I, I've never understand the concept of peace. And, like, he's a ghost, but not a ghost. That's what I've never understood. Do you guys know what that is? Like, I, I don't understand that situation. I have no idea. I don't know where it came from. I, I do know that his name, I think, has something to the phrase, like, a pet peeve. And so that's why his name's Peeves, I think. I'm not sure if that's canon. I know I've read that multiple times somewhere, so I don't know. I have no idea what Peeves. Because what Peeves is kind of weird, isn't? Doesn't he all tell the like he's not as intangible as other ghosts either, right? Because he can like interact with things. I've heard that he's like kind of a ghost, but not really a ghost. So I'm like not sure on Peeves' like status as a ghost. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if there's any backstory for Peas at all. I don't know, yeah. He's very interesting. Um, another line that I really like is as Hermione comes out the portrait hall to follow Ron and Harry, Ron immediately sees her and he gets like super like frustrated and angry and he's like he like points at Hermione, he's like, You you go back to bed and like it just it makes me feel like he's so much like Molly and it immediately like makes me think that not makes me think reminds me that like Ron is like the mother of the group he's always like the one like making sure that like Harry's okay he always makes sure that like Hermione's like eating when she's studying he's just like he just like emits this like kind of mom energy sometimes and like this is kind of like the first time you see it yeah i i totally agree with you there like uh it's, ron has this way of like saying things that seem mean or rude but if you know ron's character you realize that that's not his intention you get that in the later books with this one it's probably him being frustrated I think there's 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 something in there. There's a line in the next chapter that I'll bring up that's that's yeah. something in there. <laughs> Before hard... we get to the next chapter. Sorry. <laughs> Just me being a hardcore Hermione shipper here. I literally I remember when I was reading the books, I any time that like Ron or Hermione interacted or anything, I would be like, oh my god, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And I would just like evaluate every single thing that they said to each other and try and like see how it could possibly be them subtly flirting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same boat there with the Erica. Like I was like looking at every single interaction just like you. And I was like, is this flirting? I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> it's all flirting. But before we get to that line, you talk about Fluffy. Because they run into Fluffy this chapter. The giant monster, three headed dog, was drooling over them. His name is Fluffy. Oh my God. <laughs> I would freak out if that actually happened to me because when I was a kid, I was terrified of dogs. Like it was really bad. My parents had to take me to like see a, a therapist, it was so bad. So if that happened to me, I would like scream like bloody murder. <laughs> yeah, I used to be really scared of dogs too. So, and also like, there's dog, and this is like, giant dog with three heads is towering over you with giant teeth when you're in a small room. That's a bit terrifying for everybody. Little... Also when you're trying to hide too. <laughs> It was like a giant dog with three heads when you're trying to be quiet and hide from someone so in, in a restricted area. It just kind of adds to the, the general stress of the situation. Yeah. yeah. What I really love about this um, scene and the aftermath, really, is, well, they're all very out of breath, of course, and kind of frantic. And then, like, Neville's just like, dead <laughs> and then Ron making jokes and then Hermione's like oh my gosh sitting on a trap door obviously and I really I thought it was really interesting the difference between Ron and Harry's reactions about the statement because Ron focuses on the next thing she says and Ron's very much like oh my gosh Hermione is so silly and you think we dragged her along wouldn't you but then Harry immediately 
latches on to the trapdoor part and like his mind starts going wild and he starts thinking of these theories of what could be down there. I thought it was really interesting that Ron stayed very like I guess deta- like uh, not detached on um, like almost down to earth and focused on like the here and now while Harry was kind of off in like fantasy land. Yeah, I see that. And then we go on to the Halloween episode. Yeah. Yeah, Halloween's <laughs> always a great time at Hogwarts, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Why is there really um, anything Halloween-y, though, that happened in this chapter? <laughs> really, no. But I do love kind of the kind of the very beginning of this chapter, how it starts off with Harry getting his, like, second piece of mail, basically, and also a parcel. And... Like, you just see on the parcel, it says, like, do not open the parcel at the table. And it happens to be a Nimbus 2000 from none other than our favourite Quidditch fanatic, Professor McGonagall. Yeah, I love that. And then Ron just, not Ron, well, Ron too, but Harry's just, he's so excited because I don't think he's, ever really gotten any gifts in his life you know so it's i think like i said this whole this whole part with quidditch gave harry such a confidence boost yeah Um, and then um later on like like just immediately after uh malfoy notices and like he immediately tells on he's like um Potter's been sent a broomstick, Professor. And like Professor Flitwick, he's just like, oh yes. Yeah, that seems correct. <laughs> and and Draco's just like, what? No, this and he he's just he's trying to be all snooty, but then he just kinda exactly. gets all yes. and so you're just kinda like, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Cool. And like so Professor Flitwick is like, cool. Yeah. Sounds good. We're like First years aren't allowed to bring like broomsticks, like so. It, it's just amazing to have that kind of. It might be my it's definitely my petty side talking, but like it's so nice to have that like little win for Harry and that lose loss for Draco, you know. Yeah, and the bit of sassy Harry comes back as well because he doesn't just let it sit right. He rubs it into <laughs> Malfoy's face. He's like, yeah, it's all thanks to Malfoy that I got this. And then he and Ron just wander off and it's like, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, one line here that I just love makes me laugh so much because of all of the stuff that's going to happen in the future. And and, and they, they say that uh, Ron and Harry um, had quite the adventure and were keen to have another. I was just like, oh, honey, you got <laughs> You got a you got a long seven years ahead of you, hun. <laughs> yeah. yep. What you wish for and all that. Yep. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. And the Quidditch lesson. And Harry's so excited to start flying that he goes early and he's flying around the the pitch and it's just like my heart. He loves seeing great things for Harry. Yeah. And and Oliver just being so excited. <laughs> He's just like, Quidditch is everything. <laughs> yeah. Quidditch is my life. Yeah, and it's just so funny because, again, I really love how we're in Harry's position where we, like, don't know anything about the, like, wizarding world. And so I find it so funny when, like, when Harry's, like, so it's sort of like basketball on a broom on like broomsticks with six hoops, isn't it? And and um, Wood is like, what's basketball? And <laughs> and it's just like obviously completely backwards because like I mean basketball is completely normal to us, but like with them it's like completely foreign the way Quidditch is to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a line here that I love is uh, when um, Wood is kind of just going through the general game and explaining all the different balls and the 
the positions and then he tells Harry about how the Weasley twins are the beaters and then he says the Weasleys are a pair of human bludgers themselves so they're 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 good and it's just that line just makes me laugh because it's so true <laughs> agreed that's one of my favorite lines especially in this chapter yeah <laughs> and um, just one small aside I wanted to say because I wanted to brag about this I'm in my school's Quidditch team so what? your school has a Quidditch team? yes it does <laughs> what do you guys do? we basically run around throwing balls at each other while um, stick, having like a broomstick between our legs it's a lot <laughs> of fun and the blood is just like chucking um, like dodgeballs at everybody it's great <laughs> And the I'm, snitch is um, a person, is like a person running around the field. <laughs> I'm, I'm just picturing myself attempting to do that. And me and sports do not go well together. Like it, it's a disaster. Like when I, when I was younger, I played soccer for six years and I'm pretty sure I never scored one goal. <laughs> not even kidding. I'm not joking here. I never scored one goal. <laughs> I just joined the team because all my friends were on the team. You know, that that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I just imagined myself playing Quidditch and it just being a total disaster. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah. That was my aside because I wanted to brag about that. <laughs> but yeah. Now we talk about the snitch. And I love how Wood keeps on slipping in small things. But like, oh yeah, we've got a couple broken jaws from bludgers. And oh, don't worry about the bludgers unless they crack your head open. And oh yeah, the longest game we've ever had is three months. But don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. It's just like you know, mentioning all of these things like very like offhandedly. It's like, yeah, like people have, people have like had very, very, very serious injuries. But like, You'll be good. You'll be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come to Halloween, which first of all is like great. And I love how we can see through, like um, I think Jess mentioned before, we're in the same shoes as Harry. We don't really know much about the wizarding world. And I love how we kind of like see through his eyes, all these decorations and wonderfulness and the food. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I agree there. Halloween's. I feel like Halloween at Hogwarts would be so much fun. Mm -hmm. Just, I just, I always want to spend Halloween at Hogwarts and Christmas. That would be so much fun. I wish Hogwarts was a real place. I wish this was a real place. <laughs> um, yeah. But then I do like right, right before like the actual like Halloween part starts. We get like our infamous, infamous, our infamous um, Hermione line, which is like, it's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Yes. And it's just so, it's so funny to see it there. And it brings me so much joy. The, the line for me that really stands out is actually like later when, um, you know, when, when Hermione walks by them and she starts crying and, and um, Harry says, I think she heard you. And then Ron says, so? And then it says, but he looked a bit uncomfortable. I just, I, I look at that and in my head, I'm just like, in his, deep in his mind, he's like, oh, I shouldn't have heard her. I don't like seeing her cry. That's what comes into my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, I think sometimes Ron says things without like thinking them over and sometimes he can say things that like are a little bit harsh and he can be sometimes like a little bit mean but it's never really his intention like he isn't he's not trying to be cruel he's never trying to be cruel yeah yeah I totally agree with you there and it's, like, I, I have said this before of just the way that Ron says things sometimes, it can be in a more aggressive tone, but it's not meant to be aggressive. It's just him either being worried or like making sure that things are okay. Uh, you know, he de definitely has his comments that aren't nice, 
but like there's people there's a lot of people who just like ron who don't analyze his character before they like talk about disliking ron like i'll respect people who dislike ron and have legit reasons but people who just kind of say it without realizing without analyzing his character properly that always frustrates me yeah i agree on that as well although um when people don't like ron i just tend to not really like those kind of people <laughs> yeah. although i i think it's important to clarify though that like ron does have his reasons and like definitely before insulting him or like caring about his character you should like know his character <laughs> but yeah. at the end of the day yeah it's he does he's not a perfect person he does have flaws he's not nice in the scene so it doesn't mean like it's not okay for him to say these sort of things but there are reasons behind it yeah definitely ron that that's the thing that's so amazing about ron and i know we've said this so many times but his in every book he has character growth and you see it so much even even in this book from the beginning until the end you see it so it's oh, i just i love ron i wish he was a real person i'm so in love with this fictional character it's concerning like, i need to like i'm oh i love him so much <laughs> <laughs> i mean i also am completely in love with him I just need someone like Beta in real life to fall in love with, and then we'll be all good. Love it when literature gives us really um, high standards, you know? No, yeah. of course. But then there's also characters, fictional characters, that just are so badly written that it makes you cringe, but they could have been so amazing. And yes, I'm talking about Rey from, from Star Wars. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I get into that. I could, I could talk for hours about my issues with Ray. <laughs> Maybe we should start a Star Wars podcast. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I would run out of things to say. Like, I have lots of opinions on Star Wars, and I, I love Star Wars a lot. I'm a pretty diehard Star Wars fan, but um, it's not on the same level as Harry Potter. Like, I don't have as much of a deep connection to the characters of Star Wars as I do with Harry Potter because like I said when it comes to fictional stories whether that movies or TV shows or books it's the characters that really draw me to it so I like the characters in Star Wars but I don't have that deep connection like I do with some of the characters in Harry Potter 100% agree yeah I think that's I mean I don't I still don't really understand what it is about Harry Potter because like whether you read it when you were younger or when you were older like whether you've been in the fandom for like a year or like 10 years seems like harry potter has such a unique effect on people it touches people in a way that i feel like no other series has for me at least and i've seen that in my friends as well so like what is it about harry potter i think with harry potter it's i totally know what you mean because like for me I'm a unique situation where I read the books like when I was in my early 20s. This was more recent. And so many people read them when they were so much younger. So now I'm this 20 year old who's like insanely obsessed with Harry Potter. And it's, it's such a different situation reading it as an adult. You just, you notice things more and it, it makes you feel like you feel the, the, you know, the more serious stuff you, absorb that in a different way or you, you it's deeper the story gets deeper and you feel it more because your emotions are more developed when you're an adult as opposed to when you're like a a, a teenager you know yeah, yeah. Um, i i think you have to agree with that and then also what i really like is that unlike some books or some movies all of her character, all of like J.K. Rowling's characters, they're all flawed. They all have very like relatable flaws. And I think it just definitely helps us connect to the characters more and just makes us like feel empathy for them more maybe and 
again like the fact that we started off this like journey like not knowing anything like the main character made us like very curious and very intrigued about this world yeah i i know what you mean there and uh just just to comment there the, the whole thing about each of the characters being flawed that's something that steve close didn't understand i, I sometimes question his ability to read <laughs> we'll rant about that when we do our film comparison <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we have enough time to get into a Steve Cloves rant right now. <laughs> Are we sure we can only we should only do one episode of a film comparison? Because like we have so much to talk about, that's gonna go into more than one episode. You know, <laughs> my big ones with the film that I will go and rant on and on about is 100% Deathly Hollows Part One. Literally. Every single one of my most favorite emotional moments from that book were cut or changed. Every single one. Not one of my favorite moments were in the movie. And I, anyways, I won't get into that now, but uh <laughs> Yeah, listeners, look out for that. Stick with us when we finish Deathly Hollow so you could hear Erica's <laughs> rant. Oh, I would there that I my rant modes will go on forever and ever. Sometimes you guys will probably have to stop me. Just a just a heads up on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna say now. I feel like maybe that's not exactly gonna be a podcast. More just like a vocal essay about how much Erica hates Steve Cloves, and then me occasionally like butting in, just agreeing oh, yeah. with her. <laughs> it's like dropping in a, a phrase or two and getting off on a whole other tangent. Yes. It's like it's like it would be like a leader of like a country like making a huge dramatic speech and I'd just be like the cheering crowd going like, Yeah, I agree. Totally. And yep. <laughs> that's that's what that podcast is gonna be like. Jess, knowing you, you would not be able to just sit there and let me talk. You would need to add in your comments. I know you well enough to know that you would, like, everything that I would say, you would comment on it again. <laughs> okay, true. True, that's completely true. We didn't finish talking about the rest of this chapter. We did not. Let's get back to that. So, yeah. Do you want to talk about the trolls and the troll and the Halloween? And also, wait, one line that the reading back I thought was quite odd was when Dumbledore told the prefects to lead the houses back to the dormitories because Quirrell, Quirrell said that the troll is in the dungeons. And aren't the Slytherin dormitories in the dungeons? I feel like the Slytherins probably are, like, I'm guessing on a different part of the dungeons. Maybe it's because Snape probably knows a lot about that stuff. I don't know. That's, that's a fear. I never really thought of that. Mm, I have to agree. I never really thought about that too much either. But yeah, and then they run her Harry break off to go find Hermione, and they also find the troll. And we get that glorious fight. I'm fighting the troll. Oh my god, I love that scene. It's just they're just they're just like, what do we do? Oh my god! And they <laughs> Harry sticking his uh, wand at the troll's nose. Ew. And I, I love I love that like Ron immediately goes and does the spell that Hermione taught him to do. I like that like connection there, you know? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And oh, it's, it is. It's like, it's a very satisfying scene. It's like, and so the golden trio were formed. I heard, yeah. The famous line of, uh, from that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. Oh. Wow. It's like, yes. I yes. know. It was their first defeat. <laughs> that always makes me laugh. The first of many. <laughs> so like, first oh, of honey, many. that's not. That's not even. That doesn't even start what you're gonna do in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really love how um, 
the goggle, Snape, and Quirrell all react to coming in to see <laughs> these three tiny 11 year olds with an unconscious troll next to them. It's just like, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> and Hermione going and like taking responsibility for it. I like that part because up until this moment, all of our impressions of Hermione have been negative. So we get her coming in and, and saying that, and it gives us our first kind of little character arc for Hermione. So I like that part of it. Yeah, I I agree. And then like immediately immediately afterwards, like 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 I love that they became friends, but like immediately afterwards, like Ron already like enters like bickering mode. He's like already like well we like mind you we did save her life <laughs> and i just i find that so funny yeah with their bickering in the first few books i don't see it as much of flirting as i do in the future ones but no, there's no. always these little hints of it and, and you can see that throughout the entire series of you know, I, I read this comment someone said about how there was no build up to Ron and Hermione and I was just like the, there was seven books of build up. <laughs> you read those ones? Like every single book there's tiny little hints. There's tiny ones in the first three and then there's like huge ones in the next four. <laughs> so it's like I when I read that I, I, I just I questioned so much of just like how can you not how can you say that? <laughs> like, you yeah. may not like Ron and Hermione, but there was so much build up to that. I think I also read that as well. And, like, some of the comments were like, did we read the same books? And <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, but what you were saying earlier about it not really being flirting, like, I, I, I definitely agree with you. But, like, it's just, they, like, even when it wasn't flirting, it was still like this funny, like playful bickering, and like sometimes like more frustration than like playfulness. But it was still like this old married couple type of bickering, just from the very beginning. Even though it wasn't meant to be like flirting at that point, it was just still there. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you there. They're cute. <laughs> they are. And they're also so much 11 year olds because of that awkward thing when they're all in the common room and they don't look at each other and they say thanks and they go off and then the great line of Hermione becoming their friend. But they're so adorably awkward. <laughs> yep. Yep. Just literally these adorable dorks just being so awkward. <laughs> yeah. And then in the later books, we get all those like subtle flirty moments and then. Both Broad and Hermione like turn red, and Harry notices it, and it's just like, <laughs> yeah. And I think both Erica and I, especially, are very, very, very excited for those moments, and we're gonna have an even harder time shutting up about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's gonna be great. Plus, I'm probably going to be talking a lot about the Ginny moment, so. I, I, I like can't those. wait till Ginny comes. Does that wrap up those chapters? Yeah. That does, it yeah. Is. yeah. Any last comments about these two chapters? No. no. These are ones, these two chapters kind of switch the tone from what's to come. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that in between chapters of like Harry being all excited about being at Hogwarts to the main plot line, you know? Yeah. Um, the heroes have all come together and now they can get on to the giant mystery. Yeah. Um, Alrighty guys, so that wraps up chapters 9 and 10. And then next time, we're going to be doing chapter 11, which is uh, talking about Quidditch, the first Quidditch game. And then chapter 12, which is the Mirror of Erised. So come back for that. We're super excited to talk about these two chapters when the actual main plot line starts getting 
really heated. Oh, yeah. Oh, I might, may burst into tears, not tears, but just emotional during the Mirror of Arisad chapter. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll be surprised if, if any of us stay like, detached during that. Yeah. It's just a sweet scene. <laughs> but yeah. So this is Mega signing off. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you guys next time.